Uh, my name is Ben Doyle. Um, I'm the chair of the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience. And uh, it is fantastic to see so many people here tonight. Um, some that I know as real champions from Montpelier and some that I look forward to meeting. It's just really, um, it's an honor to be here with you. And um, you know, I, I was just gonna tell a brief anecdote. I, I don't know if folks remember this, but maybe like six or seven years ago, there was a downtown and historic preservation conference in Montpelier with the Creative Community Exchange. It was this big event in Montpelier and there were like five or 600 people from around New England that came to Montpelier to talk about community vibrancy. And they picked Montpelier intentionally because of what an incredible town it is and of all the interesting and exciting things that were happening as an example of what a vibrant downtown could look like. And I was, remember sitting in a session in a room where there was a municipal leader talking about community engagement and she said, uh, when you're doing anything good for your community or really anything good in life, um, you manifest your intent through your presence. And I'm not this person, but I wrote that down. And I put, I put it on my computer screen and I look at it sometimes that we manifest our intent through our presence. And that just means that we do good things by showing up. And you folks have showed up tonight. And um, the entire town of Montpelier, we've showed up for each other. And that work continues. And there's a lot of work to do. But we're so glad that you're here tonight to think with us about that work. So I'm here to just briefly introduce and remind you all, like, what is the Commission on Recovery and Resilience? And what are we doing? Um, you'll remember that there was a series of forums after the, the, the flood where the community came together. A thousand people participated in this to identify priorities that they wanted to see for recovery and resilience. And then coming out of that, this commission was formed. It's a for it was a partnership between the city of Montpelier, the Montpelier Foundation, and Montpelier Alive. And those three partners convened uh, this commission. People applied to be on it and were appointed. And you know the thing that's really wild about this, and frankly is my favorite thing, this commission has no real authority, right? The only authority we really have is the will of the people that we're trying to uh, help move their ideas forward. Right? Uh, we're a partner to city government, but we're not a part of city government. We're not an independent, nonprofit organization. We're an initiative that is taking all the ideas from the community and trying to be a vehicle to help move them forward. We're a connector, a convener, an advocate. And we just really are trying to use uh, our, our work and our experience and our connections to just really help good things happen in Montpelier. I just want to really quickly say, you know, something that I actually said at the last forum, but it's still true. You know, I think in community and economic development or in efforts like this, um, the towns that succeed uh, have two things in common. One is that they have collaborative, visionary leadership, and two, they have relentless optimism. And I know that we have both, and that you're here tonight because you have that too, and um, I'm just really excited to be here with you. So where we are right now in this stage is you know, we've, we've been working for months and months and months and we had a public forum three months ago where we shared with you some really broad, high level goals, right? And, and kind of values of this commission and the way in which we're gonna approach this work. And we've basically taken all the ideas from the forums and the priorities and put them into three buckets. Watershed management, right? Because what's happening in Montpelier with flooding it doesn't just happen here, it's a watershed issue. We need to be talking and thinking on a watershed issue level. Um, the second one is an adaptive downtown. How do we take this incredible historic built environment that we love and how do we make it more resilient for the next flood that we know is going to happen? What are the changes we can make to, to, to make that work? And then the third is emergency response. Right? That is obviously like uh, the, you know, the city does a job of um, continuance of operations of municipal services, but there's a whole other part that um, needs help, and that's thinking about how are we helping our neighbors? Right? How do we immediately jump in to help them when they need help? How do we immediately jump in to help businesses when they need help? What does that comprehensive plan look like um, to, to um, make sure that everybody's getting the help that they need? And so those are the three buckets, and then we took that from the last kind of community forum where we got feedback on all of that, and the commission continued to work to distill them more into actionable projects. It's great to have a theoretical idea of like, 
We need to solve the watershed issue. But what does that actually look like on a practical day-to-day -day level? And that's where we're at right now, is moving those kinds of projects forward. And so tonight, um, we're gonna share with you more detail on that and then ask for your feedback on it. But the most important thing I have to do tonight is to introduce uh, the new executive director of the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience. We, uh, this was a big deal. <laughs> we got over 60 applicants for this job. We got people from outside the country applying to this job, from outside the state applying to this job. We interviewed a ton of people, and uh, I, I am just absolutely thrilled with the person that we've selected. Uh, if you know John Copans, he's been in this community for decades. He has experience at the state level, the federal level, deep experience with community engagement. Uh, and you know, most importantly, he, he has a, a, a great moral center and he loves this town. And um, we're so excited at the commission, uh, you know, these com the commission members to, to be partner with John and to help him be successful so that we can all be successful together. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John. Thanks everybody. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, that is uh, extremely generous of you. Uh, so I'm John Copans. I've lived, lived in town. I live up on Cliff Street with my family. In fact, my family is upstairs providing some child care right now if anybody needs it. But uh, I, um, we've got a lot of work to do tonight, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time introducing myself. I will just say it's, uh, it just feels like a tremendous privilege to get to do this work this critical work in, in my home community. I really, and uh, that work is nothing without the community, without all of you, without all of us pull, pulling together. So uh, that's in large part what tonight is about, is sharing uh, priorities that, that the commission has arrived at and really learning from you all, engaging you with you all uh, as we work to build action plans around those priorities. So what I'm going to do, in fact, is uh, give you a quick overview of five of the priorities that we're not going to have deep conversations about tonight, uh, but are ongoing things that you've heard about from us before to some degree, but that we are continuing to work on as a commission. And then we're going to pull up commissioners who are going to go into more depth about the main, the main priorities tonight, just to give you a sense of, of where we are on our agenda. So I, let me start right in on that. Uh, the post office. Uh, Amazing work, folks, in terms of your advocacy uh, with our congressional delegation and with the USPS. We know we're making progress on that front. They are working uh, to open up that location on City Center at this point. So that is progress. But you know what? We're leaving it on the list because our sense is maybe that work isn't done. We all know that Montpelier should have a full service post office in downtown. That's not a question. Who knows what happens in the next year or two uh, with the federal building? We, we feel like we've got to keep that one on the list to bird dog that. So that's USPS. We're, we're, we as a team need to be on, on that one. All right, next. Uh, five home farm way. Uh, folks know that probably is the space behind Agway. Uh, what's in process right now is to actually transfer ownership of that parcel to the city and to remove that old structure from the property. What comes next after that is really trying to be uh, very strategic in terms of what we deploy on the land there to maximize sort of the water carrying capacity of that parcel, essentially. What strategies can you deploy to allow the water to spread on that parcel before it flows into Montpelier? It's actually an example of what we need to do throughout the watershed, but here's an example where uh, it is in process to make that happen. There's work to be done with engineers to really do the analysis. For the commission, we are gonna continue to sort of work with the various partners to push that forward. That's that. Next, uh, you know, um, we all remember the work that happened at the hub here in Montpelier, right? So many people came there, and what the hub was in a lot of ways was an exchange. People came because they had something offer to offer to their neighbors, and people came because they needed something. And the hub was that short-term 
solution to make that connection between needs and things to offer. Guess what? The needs don't just disappear after two or three weeks, right? What we know is there are still people in our community suffering from impacts of the flood. And what we have, uh, and I shouldn't say we, we have an incredible leader in, uh, in Suzanne here. I'm going to point uh, to Su Suzanne Laguerre Belcher, who has stepped forward to lead this organization called the Montpelier Disaster Recovery Network to provide that ongoing facilitation of really supporting those who are suffering from long-term impacts of the flood and to really uh, bring to life uh, those offers in the community. So um, that uh, actually tonight, we are gonna have a station for Suzanne. Suzanne's gonna be right over here. My plea to you all is, uh, Here's what Suzanne needs. Suzanne needs sort of two layers of work. Suzanne is actually, uh, they are still building a leadership team to run that effort. So they need some s sort of board members uh, around communications, around development, uh, around organization as they get going with their work. But they also need doers, people who maybe it's as simple as like, holding a hammer, going, going to someone's house, doing that kind of work, or it's doing outreach in the community to make sure we're finding those folks who still, who still need support. So my plea to you all is please, uh, if you've got something to offer, or honestly, if you need something, please connect with Suzanne uh, as part of tonight's, uh, tonight's program. All right, uh, the next one is, you know, one thing that we, uh, have heard or that the commission has heard is sort of what is the playbook to refer to when we're in the midst of an emergency or disaster. And uh, the sense is both at the sort of residential level and at the business level, we really need to build a toolkit uh, uh, so that people know what do they do, who do they call, uh, how do they respond when they're at that moment, uh, moment of crisis. So uh, this is, again, a partnership. Uh, it might be, in fact, that we're working with the city. It might be that we're working with uh, Montpelier Alive and their connection to businesses or the community and economic development uh, folks uh, with Central Vermont. But uh, the sense is we need to build those toolkits. So that is another, another project of the commission. And then finally, the final one I'm gonna mention tonight is around really community education and learning. Uh, if what we know is we need to act, we need to do some big things as a community, and acting means having some common understanding of what the challenges we face are. So uh, that could take many different shapes. Maybe it's about having some walking tours around town where we look at the rivers and we understand better from a hydrologist or a river engineer just you know, where is that water coming from and what strategies can we deploy. Maybe it's a workshop. Maybe it's working with our schools. Education is going to take a bunch of different forms. In fact, we've got a little, a little, uh, a little board over there for folks to add your ideas in terms of what kind of education uh, you feel like we, we need as a community. But we know that's work that the commission needs to do uh, as well. So that brings me to the end of my list of priorities. Now what I get to do is I'm actually going to hand it off to the first commissioner who will then hand it off to the next commissioner. But we've got uh, different commissioners coming up to talk through with you uh, our sort of five key priorities tonight. And then I will come back up and explain how the rest of the evening is going to go. So with that, uh, river improvements. And that is Stephanie Smith speaking about that. Thanks, Stephanie. Don't want to mess with this, I'll stand on my toes. Hi everyone, Stephanie. Um, I will be over here talking about the River Initiative, uh, which is a statewide scoping assessment to work with regional planning commissions for outreach to our communities uh, and engineering firms to develop projects that can have some, some incredibly meaningful impacts on lowering flood elevations in our downtowns. So we're working with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. We're very lucky to have Keith and Christian here who will be with me over here working on the initial phases of this to gather input from the community, see what types of projects are out there. Things like Five Home, five home Farm Way where we can lower flood elevations, reduce risk broadly within the community. Um, and we're very excited to have SLR as our engineering firm. The lead is a, a local resident 
president, Roy Schiff, who is brilliant, lives in Montpelier, and very excited to get underway with that project. So if you want to hear more, we'll be over here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Gwynn. Um, I'm on the working group that is working towards building a comprehensive community action plan. Um, a lot of what we heard after the flood immediately was that people didn't know who to turn to or what was happening. What we've learned, the more work we've done, is that the city has an excellent plan for their continuing operations and for keeping all of those things going. But there are other things out in the community that are simply not the city's job. They're our job. They're your job. Um, but whoever you ask, it always that guy's job that didn't get done. So one of the things that we've identified as a real need is to have a well-documented plan that is uh, set out ahead of time, that is rehearsed and is kept alive even in times of blue skies so that the community as a whole is ready when the next event is inevitably going to happen. To that end, we've hired a consultant um, team that is led by Erica Borneman, who was the, help me out, Ricardo, what was her title before? The, the Director of Vermont Emergency Management. Um, and we, we interviewed uh, multiple consultants and decided that her team had the best approach for our community specifically. They are based in Vermont, and um, she was here bucking out basements in, in the immediate aftermath. So um, that work is beginning now. We are beginning with stakeholder engagement will be the first step talking to members of the city to find out what they feel went well what they feel could have gone better talking with alec ellsworth and the folks at the mop at the the volunteer hub as well as business owners individual residents to find out from everyone what went well what could have gone better and develop a cohesive plan that everyone can buy into before it's really necessary and we'll be right over here in that dark corner by the exit sign when the time comes <laughs> The dark corners will once again be in the light soon, I promise. Um, hello, everybody. My name is James Ray. Um, the next priority that we're going to be that we're going to be having a corner to talk about with you in more in more depth is engaging um, and, and celebrating and, and encouraging regional conversations. The phrase "We are in this together" has never been more true than when you are speaking about the people and the communities who share a watershed. We share the peril and we will share the success going forward with what we can address in that watershed to ensure that future events impact us as little as possible. And that means that the communities and the, and the hard work that's, that's happening in Montpelier, that's happening in Cabot, that's happening in Middlesex and Waterbury, and every other community throughout the entire Winooski watershed, um, you know, I think you've all experienced in your own, your own lives, in your own work, well-meaning people doing their task, it, it, the, it's, we, you, you focus on the task in front of you with all the best intentions. Um, if we as a watershed do that to a fault, we're not doing our jobs. We, we're going to need to make sure that every so often all of the parties doing their hard work in their own corners look up, look at each other, sit down at the table, check in with each other. What are you doing? What are we doing? Are we at cross purposes? Are we, in, are we, are we bolstering the entire watershed's ability to slow down water, to capture water, to withstand these events more, more thoroughly going forward? And to that extent, uh, the commission is going to do its share. I, don't, I am not going to stand here and pretend to you or claim that this commission is a leader in those, in those conversations. Uh, the document in front of you and the document at our station lists many of, of the organizations that are gonna be important pieces of those conversations. So it's not to say, we're not you know, so prideful as to say we're the leader of those conversations. What we are to say is that the commission, the Montpelier Commission, is an active and very energetic and eager participant in those conversations. And we're gonna do our part to make sure that those conversations happen and the cooperation happens so that improvements across the watershed are knitted together in a way that can benefit all communities as thoroughly as possible. I am excited to say that, that a key partner in, the, in those conversations, Pat Moulton with the State Recovery Office, is here and will be a key person um, and with the discussion around this priority in our station during the next hour. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Walk is next. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, I'm Peter Walk. Uh, it's a 
honestly, it's a joy to be here with you all tonight. Uh, the work of this commission has been incredibly powerful. Uh, as I say to my fellow commissioners, there are very rarely where you have a three-hour meeting every other week and you leave more excited than when you arrived. This group has done incredible work. We are incredibly excited to bring these ideas that we've developed for your feedback. Uh, one of the things is we've been thinking about, we, have, we benefit in this city from having a wealth of existing work. We've done city master plans. We've looked at our downtown core. We've looked at the state capital complex. What we haven't done is center the river in that study to do a, water's edge, a river's edge master plan, to think about within the city limits, what can we do, what can we think about, about the way we interact with the river, the relationship that we have with the river, both as cities and as residents, as part of the community, to be able to make sure that we are not, we're not afraid of our rivers, that we're embracing them and figuring out the ways in which we coexist in order to have the best community we possibly can. So really excited about that conversation moving forward. Please join us in the back right corner if you'd like to talk about the River's Edge Master Plan. Uh, my name is Nathan Suter. I'm on the commission. I am a neighbor, I think, of most of yours. I live here in Montpelier. Thank you very much for coming tonight. <clears throat> One thing I am not, I'm not a building scientist. And my guess is that most of us are not building scientists. So what does that mean? If you care about energy efficiency and you want to do a better job of conserving energy, you call Efficiency Vermont or you call an energy auditor and they come and they figure out how much air does your building lose? How good is your insulation? Things like that, right? You depend upon a professional to figure that out and then they give you a list that says do this first, then do that, and then do that. So. I make that analogy because anybody who has a building, a home, a commercial building uh, in, de in the downtown, they're probably not building scientists either. So one of the things we've been thinking about is, okay, what tools <clears throat> can we as a commission facilitate or catalyze into being that helps everybody in the downtown or every, every building on the, owner in the downtown? Or if you're a business owner who occupies a building that is owned by somebody else, how can you be sure that the next time our city floods, because it will, you can recover more quickly. The building you're in, you can reoccupy. If it's, a, if it's housing, you can reoccupy that. The heat will be on in November if you need it to be on. So our solution, or our proposed solution, is a downtown building survey, where our goal is to create a project where we hire a consultant or hire engineers to assess, survey and assess every single building in the flood zone in our downtown so that every building owner has that list. What are the first things that I can do? What's the next thing that I can do? And then they have the tools to engage with contractors or um, others, other specialists to get those projects done in the time that they can when they have the funds. So that's our vision for this project. Uh, our idea is to find ways to fund that as much as possible, make it as accessible as possible to the building owners, and then everyone in the downtown is equipped with the right information, and as they make choices about their buildings, they're making them in a way that is building a more adaptive downtown. So I will be in the bright, shiny corner by the DVDs as you enter if you want to talk with me about that idea, especially thinking about how do we convince our neighbors that this is a good idea and to engage in this process once we stand it up? So thank you all for coming. Uh, John, you're up. Okay. Uh, big thanks to those commissioners for running through those priorities. So uh, actually, Mark, if you could bring up the map, I think that would be a helpful thing for us to see now. So the idea for the next hour is that we're having small, small group conversations around uh, those priorities that you just heard about uh, outlined by the commissioners. What you see is a little bit of a map just to give you a sense of where I am standing where river improvements is, right? So that conversation is going to happen right here. Uh, Montpelier action plan for local emergency uh, over there in that corner. Engage regional conversations and River Edge Masters plan are both in that room. And then finally, uh, the survey of downtown buildings in the corner, as Nathan mentioned. The last one I want to mention is the everything else conversation. Because I imagine 
there's maybe some priorities that you didn't hear us outline that you're concerned about. Or maybe you want to hurt, talk about one of those priorities that I talked about earlier on, or you've just got something else on your mind. That conversation is going to be happening in the side room right behind uh, Ben over there. The, uh, the idea here. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. A uh, couple things. One, the idea here is we're going to ring a bell every 15 minutes. That's just sort of a guide for you all that you may want to move on to a next conversation. It's just kind of a time marker. You're really free to roam around these conversations as, as you see fit. Go to what interests you. You can try to hit them all, or um, you, can, you could spend your entire hour uh, on one topic if, if you so desire. But listen for that bell as, a, as maybe a prompt to, to move along. There it is. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is to remind folks that, yes, as Mark said, Suzanne is going to be here with the Montpelier uh, Disaster Recovery Network. Please, uh, if you've got something to offer or you need something, feel free to stop by that station. And also, there are a couple of easels there with post-it notes along this hallway uh, with two questions. Uh, what does a resilient Montpelier look like for you? And what do you see as educational priorities for us as we, as we do the work around education here in the community? Finally, I want to mention one other person who's here who we should acknowledge, which is uh, Mark mentioned that we've hired a consultant uh, headed uh, by, uh, this, uh, by Erica Borneman, but we also have Tori Littlefield here from that consulting group who's going to be part of that conversation tonight. So just wanted you to have a sense that we're, we're getting started with some of this work, and it's great to integrate some of that into, into what we're doing tonight. So with that, I think we're ready to go. We'll turn on the lights, and uh, we'll, we'll get after it. Thanks so much. other opportunities really looking up and downstream and how do we remove bells, slow the river down to its space um, before it gets into downtown and then milliseconds after. Um, two things. A question is, hey, how are you? is the uh, scope of work for the consultant a public document, something we can see? It's, um, yeah, I don't, there's broad overviews on it. Period. Having the engineers then come in and look at all the river assessments that we've already done right. to see what already exists, looking at all the input from the engagement that comes in at the beginning, doing an assessment to to figure out how much flood reduction benefit we could see from different yeah. potential projects, and then proposing those back. Great so idea. from a high level, that's the yeah. that's the overview, and then applying for funding to to do some of that. Work. Great idea. Second thing is not a question. It's <clears throat> and this is either valuable or useless information. I understand that downtown flooded because the North Branch couldn't get into the Winooski. And that was because the con right at the confluence of the North Branch and the Winooski, the same time Wrightsville was built, there was a channelization project to create more buildable land in downtown. And so we have, I think the parking lots that you guys were talking about, state parking lots may sit on that. On the other side of the river, I think there's stuff along, uh, is that River Street? Memorial. Memorial. So uh, that's probably a very simplistic notion. But were that, and in fact, one last, uh, the little branch bank that sits up here uh, on uh, State Street, no, on, uh, yeah, no, Main Street, uh, and it's a drive-through bank it's on the corner with uh, TD Bank, series of all black and white photos from like turn of the century. And there, that spot that I'm describing is three times as wide as it is today. So I assume that your project will, among other things, look at that space so that if the possibility is there for the North Branch to have some place to go rather than spread through Montpelier, 
that's explored. Thank you very much. I think the other thing that occurred, I'm sorry, you were having this question. This is a little bit like that, but it's not exactly. It's one of the things that caused a lot of damage in Montpelier was that the stormwater system couldn't accommodate yes. all the water that was running through it. And so water was like fountaining up into people's neighborhoods and just flooding like crazy. So somehow in all of our conversations, the infrastructure of the uh, city needs to be included, I think. I mean, obviously, if you bring the water level down, you help ameliorate that problem. But that was huge. I mean, there were places that would never have had any damage <laughs> if it wasn't flowing up. Well, it was in December. Uh -huh. okay. So I live in the Bear Apartments. Uh, and Bear Apartments. Um, and that, you're actually absolutely right. There were geysers. Yeah. But that yielded like this much water in our basement area from the rocks. All of a sudden, when the north branch overflowed, it went from that to this. In the course of half hour, 20 minutes. Incredible. So, so, so anyway, I just want to point that out and make sure that we don't lose that in this big picture conversation. I don't know quite where it fits, but this is so important to helping. So these projects are sponsored. So this is a priority that rises to the top with the city Literally. <laughs> yeah um, it's would would storm water be eligible we'd have to look into that it would maybe yeah, yeah. yeah. okay and that's also the kind of thing I was thinking of is like capturing some of that water before it overwhelms the system yeah it's exactly. gotta go somewhere you know yeah. right um, it just ends up in somebody else's basement yeah. I'm looking at the word projects and I also understand there's been a lot of various planning that's been done what I'm wondering is the long-term plan. Has anybody said, because this is like the upstream stuff, right? Not what we can do in the physical infrastructure in Montpelier. It's like, what can we do upstream to mitigate the impact, right? I mean, other people are looking at resiliency of Montpelier and how to do that. So I guess my question is like, how do you know what priorities are going to have the biggest impact without looking at the whole like, hey, why are they talking about logging? You know, in the Worcester Range, yeah, well, we know exactly. the logging reduces you know, the ability of the forest to, you know, kind of what. So I just wanted, like, how big is this effort versus, oh, let's take down this house over here versus, like, hey, what we really need to do is stop logging or I don't know what those priorities. So what I'm wondering is what's been done, how are we looking at the big picture, and how are we coming up with the plan to then identify the plan. So. Yeah, so the, the firm and with CBRPC that's looking at Montpelier is also looking at Barry. So we the intent was looking at the downtowns that flooded and how do we lower flood elevations looking up and downstream of those. So it's going to connect in Barry, Montpelier, Kruberlin, looking further up. I don't know if we'll get as, quite as far as the forest land that you're talking about, but the idea is to take that broader approach of up and downstream, but there could be projects in town that come out of that too. That's absolutely possible. Yeah, I have to go on a tangent from this, not this program, but as a regional planning commission, we write a regional plan. <laughs> Um, and it lays out all those policies we're going to promote and work towards. Um, if these are some of the ideas that rise to the top as effective ways to mitigate flooding, then, you know, we work with our members in Cabot, Marshfield, Plainfield, or uh, Washington, Williamstown, Barry, uh, to identify some of those uh, supporting projects, those complementary projects that are not discrete engineering projects like you're talking about in this program, but maybe are more system focused. Yeah, I mean, is there like a watershed management plan for the Winooski watershed up to Montpelier. Like Montpelier. The iron water plan, it's called the tactical basin plan. Yeah. Uh, so there is a, there is planning on that. Uh, generally, that's been done more on the clean water focus than the entire flood focus. Right. So, but that is, I mean, it has been done. And they are uh, tr starting to broaden that focus, you know, especially uh, due to last summer's flooding, trying to think beyond just clean water of when you're thinking of that entire basin, how to address that. So that's why I, get, I guess what I'm getting at, sorry if I'm done with but a river a rivershed management plan that focuses on flood mitigation. That seems to be, I don't, I'm just not familiar with all the studies that have been done. Yeah, they're like, hey, what can we do up in the Worcester Mountains? Or what can we do up in Cabot? And looking at that scope of things that we can do, oh, there's this area that got washed out. So 
Is that something that we're, is being considered as part of the consultant scope, or it's more narrow than that, and that's a longer term? It's a start. I don't think it'll get us as far as you're suggesting, but I think we absolutely should get there, and this is a start. It's a start in that direction. So this scope is more narrow, but when we talk about engaging in regional conversations, it includes that broader, that broader watershed overall plan. Okay. So what is the goal? You cite the goal of, of the work. What's the goal? I'm going to defer to... Uh, <laughs> because I'm here. Because, because I can. <laughs> because I'm here. Yeah, I, I, the intent when we started this was to look at where where are the downtowns or community centers that were hardest hit across the state and what sort of projects can we identify that can lower flood elevation. So it's to lower so flood lower elevation. Lower the flood elevation. And it's, I think part of the trick is there's not one fix, there's not one thing we can do that just eliminates flooding in Montpelier. So the hope is that we'll end up with a list of we can upsize this culvert, we can do restoration here, we can do a bunch of these things, and they'll have this much flood reduction in our downtown. So showing that map of here are all the things we could do, here's the incremental benefit of those, so we can start to put together, a, depending on the cost and the value of these projects, some priorities around what we want to do. Could you say, another way to say it, the goal is to spare the downtown? flood impact. That's the ultimate we can get there? Yes. I, so I so that's, is that, is that's what a goal is? So that is the goal? Yeah. And that's a good goal overall, but it's also informed by the fact that there's a great deal of money available from FEMA through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program for projects to do that. Yeah. So when we think about trying to be strategic about what we all take on, it makes sense to focus on this because there's going to be money available. Absolutely. But everything that you do ought to be guided by what the ultimate and then these little action things are achievable objectives. Because uh, I think rather than prepare the downtown, we should try to spare the downtown. It's an irreplaceable cultural resource and asset. So it, there, it, there should be like a trade off the at attitude. Ought to be, we're trying to not have another one of these things. Yeah. Is that accurate? Is that a goal? You agree with that? I, that's, I think that's where we're going. I think it's an incremental step, step process. Oh, oh, so oh, so yeah, part of it is important. trying to, I think a lot of our talent that we're out talking to or think there's one thing they can do that affects everything. Yeah. And I think part of it is trying to yeah. make trying to communicate in a way that doesn't lead people to think yeah. that there's just one thing that gets rid of No, I understood. But there are all those individual things are aiming towards something. That's the goal, yes. Ultimately that would be <laughs> Building, building the general services, sorry. Um, because, you know, uh, now that there's uh, so many state workers now working remotely, uh, there's a whole lot of paved land along the river that uh, seemingly something more intelligent could be done with, but uh, that every time I've seen any discussion, it's, oh, well, we can't touch that because the state employees might want it. You know, and it's sort of like, this is a... Uh, perk that comes with the uh, state employment rather than, uh, you know, what is a toxic waste dump along our river, so. So, uh, you know, I'll say this from my perspective as a former state agency official is, state agency employment has changed, right? The, the nature of hybrid and remote work is here to stay. It is, we have to learn how as a community to have the economic and vibrant downtown the activity that we want, the uh, interaction with our state employees when they're here and present in the community, and what to do with the space in a more dense and compact way for parking purposes, and then how to better utilize that space moving forward. Uh, that takes a true conversation, because the state, as an actor, has to, you know, has to, they, you know, DGS has simple directives, right? They have to house and provide access to buildings for all state employees, right? If we can bring to them opportunities to think differently and to get, to do different things with the kind of the, the enthusiasm of a community behind it, we may be able to change that narrative. So the conversation you and I have been having for a decade now on what to do with the parking behind uh, the capital complex could change, could actually change because now there is 
one more reason why parking there may not make the most sense. Isn't there some capacity for for having both? Because there are models for floodable cities and floodable buildings and floodable parks and floodable structures. Yes. And is that sort of? I mean, yeah. I, I assume no, that's no, the what direction. Are, what are the, what are like, like you know, you had, let history be our guide. But the, one of the cool things about that two thousand. Your uh, uh, capital complex master plan was the idea of this uh, this park area, kind of right where that that is, that was uh, a big bowl that had a lowered access to the river, so that when it did flood, it would flood the big bowl. Oh, by the way, you could also flood it in the wintertime and have it be a skating rink for the community. Right, there are all sorts of really interesting ideas that exist out there that have been done in different communities around the world. And so we don't need to read about the real. We need to take advantage of that, that science and that knowledge that's been developed and bring it to bear here and understand where we want to put our, our you know, blood, sweat, and tears and precious dollars into that work. Briefly, uh, I, I find it interesting to hear the commission's um, ideas about being a convener and, and being in all of the conversations and connecting parties that wouldn't otherwise talk to each other. And I think that some of the pressure from Dan and other people is like, not only do we want the commission to convene those conversations, but we also want them to actively advocate for specific, you know, positive goals. And um, I can imagine how difficult that balance is. And like, if you advocate in the wrong moment to the wrong degree, of course, people will block you off the next time you want to convene a meeting, just to talk. Um, and, and yet, I feel like it's really important to get that, like, not just bring people together, but say, and this is what we want, and here's why. <laughs> the, that last part, I think, is the most important, right? Like, I think when James was talking for this community education component, what that's really about is creating an app, authorizing environment for hard things to happen, right? Like, there are fundamental changes that are going to happen in our town. And, you know, I think we know sometimes the history of Montpelier is ideas... Yeah, you know, that it's, it's, it's like, let's be honest, it's a challenging environment sometimes, with, you know, and so the idea here is if we can not just like say, hey, this is the thing, right, if we can say, we need to all understand the conditions here, right, we need to understand the, the entire river port, right, and then that kind of community education helps create an authorized environment, so that when you say something like, you know, we shouldn't rebuild that parcel, right, like that people be like, well, we get it. You know, I think that that's, and I want to be just be really clear. Like, I think we see our role as advocating for very specific things to happen. But it behooves no one if we're not strategic and really thoughtful about how that That goes back to the lacking, like, explicit, you know, convening authority. I mean, we don't have, we have, we have nobody's authority, but you're all, right? We are present and here today to try to move things forward. And we're going to do that by convening people. That is the strongest form of advocacy I know to, move, to make hard things happen. So, and, and as well as regional planning commissions and others who can really engage communities. I mean, like, I've had some conversations with Marshall, God bless them. They've got nine or ten different watershed projects we're trying to do now. Like one town clerk and a volunteer select board, you know? I mean, how are they going to get this done? So there is a municipal technical assistance program that our PCs can provide. So, you know, there's a lot of weight on Christian Meyer and, and the Central Vermont RPC, but there's also some funding to help us do that. And that's part of my 
job is to convene these regional conversations along the Horn and Steel River watershed and really try to bend the, try to bend the needle. Ned Swanberg, who is a Montpelier resident here, is like, there is no silver bullet. It's about 45 different silver bullets over time that are going to make a difference. And in this town, we have the confluence of the two regions. We got a whole lot of concrete going on. Same with Barry. You know, how are we going to de armor these labor banks? You know, how do we, and, and what can we do to slow the rain down? Rain gardens, um, you know, the riparian buffers you've spoken about. It's all that matters. You may not think, oh, what's my dinky little rain garden going to be? Well, it could, you know, slow down. The eight inches of rain that comes, and, and you know, and, and so I don't profess to know any of the technologies, but those are the things we've got to the what else are you all thinking of? Fred, you had your hand up. Well, I, I live in my period and I haven't gone to any of your meetings, so it's really overwhelming. Well, you guys are wonderful. <laughs> These guys are wonderful. Commission Yeah, are you in the smoke? No, are you a professor and are you a hydrologist? I've, I've done, uh, come out of the geobotany yeah. field at UVM and I've been teaching, uh, but I'm in the field office down in southern Vermont. What do you do? Nothing. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I heard it layer. for about three minutes. That was <laughs> I would volunteer to work with anybody uh, who wants to convene meetings and wants help. Paul is one of the world's greatest Good. facilitators of conveners. Yes. Lucky to have him out. I think you're hearing in the ideas and the with the urgency that with its professed and the ideas and, and the different um, organizations mentioned your your work uh, so that's mentioned the work that you mentioned why I think we feel that these you know the regional conversations are so important because there is there is so much intelligence in the state there is so much experience there there are so many powerful ideas for urgent action um, with a lot of danger that the, the ten or you know the, the, the dozens of people doing that work we may never know a couple of dozen who are doing similar work, a couple of blocks away from them. Right, right. And, and, and missing opportunities to build scale by connecting. I think that's the heart of, I think, what I'm speaking for myself, I think, and hopefully for the commission, that the urgency behind making sure conversations happen. And Paul, I really appreciate you putting the fire urgency, but it's not sort of like, you know, long-term meetings and flowing discussions. It's things have to happen now and recognizing that some of the most powerful things that happen now are going to come when this gentleman meets with Pat, meets with some of the you know, the, when those puzzle pieces fit together as soon as possible. But it's also going to be uh, your with as much money as possible. <laughs> with as much money. But it's also going to be supporting your municipal governments to make these tough decisions yeah. and, and to go after you know, I mean, to get get them moving, you know, and and get them supporting and and having them talk to their neighboring officials, you know, to say, look, literally, as was said, we're all in this together. What happens in Barry affects Montpelier. What happens in Montpelier affects Waterbury. What happens in Cabot affects all of us. You know, it's and uh, so it's important to 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 support your municipality in this work as well. So. Would be able to facilitate oh, this. We don't, want to, we don't want to, we, we seem to shy away from right. 180 countdowns and no. Uh, you mean the proverbial no, third rail, at least, as yeah. we call it? There's. Pat, before you ask that, there's one in my And how to help your neighbors and what part of the plant. It seemed to me a lot of people I know had to like turn off their electricity. That makes sense. I don't know how to turn off electricity in a house, and a lot of people don't know how to do that. Like stuff like that, where you can just train or at least have someone in the neighborhood who knows these things and kids. Right. Take care of yourself first and then reach out to your next door neighbor and so on and so on. I think it would be uh, a welcome thing to have more knowledge to know what, how to help yourself. That's really an excellent suggestion. Would you write that down and stick that up on the on either one of the boards, the education sure. topics? 
that would be terrific. Um, and also, what is what is resilience look like? That's part of it. Yeah. That, that, that is also a part of it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people who do survival. Exactly. You know, go bang. I have to turn on the propane. I just looked at what looked like the valve <laughs> thing that was coming in from the tank. And, Heard it without any real knowledge of what it was. Let's uh, open up the circle. Let some new new people come in. And if you if you've had your fill of us, by all means, there are other stations that are uh, watershed and rivers. Uh, so when when you when there's a flood, is there uh, a written report and reaction to it that's filed away? Do we know what do we know what the profile of the I assume that the profile of the flood as it hits the city is different in each, for each event. But do we do we know it? Do we know that what that is? Are we keeping good records? The commission itself is not keeping good records. It's not really our role. But there are always reports. I know that the city has an after-action report for what went well and what it did so well. I haven't read the thing, so I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it all went well. Do you guys do reports on the flood? Yeah, we're not, we're, we're not river specialists. We're police officers. You know, like the, the river people do the river stuff. You're talking about yeah, hydrology, right? Like you're talking about like how much rain yeah. is how much. It, it might be nice to, to know that uh, July flood had uh, had this effect in this streets and at this height. A footprint. You want that swan? You want that swan? He's a, he's a, a watershed management expert that's part of the commission. Where is he? He's over there in the river uh, river corridor. But basically, he works for, he works for um, the state of Vermont as like oh, okay. a floodplain. Ricardo, what does Ned do? Flood plane. He's the guy that like he's the guy. And they right. can like show you the PowerPoint presentation of like well, that'd be interesting. Yeah, and that's yeah. part of I think where the role is like the community education right. component is to kind of do those kinds of things and not just like at meetings like this, but actually get them online, right? Or like circulating so that people have a common understanding of what you're asking about. Right? That like so help us to plan if we knew where the floods were <laughs> and how they changed. And how they might be uh, affected by steps that we take. Yeah. Yes. It, it's also important to remember that people, it wasn't just people, people were not just affected by the river level rising. You know, there's there's plenty of people uh, like me who live on higher ground, but who, there was a lot of water up there too. So, yes. so we've got to think about things outside the floodplain as well. I know people who were affected whose uh, backup systems, sewer systems, uh, failed at that moment. And so they had a basement full of water, but they were not seen to be within the flood zone. <laughs> you know that. I'm You're one. Because it's a, it was a stormwater system. Yeah, yeah. yeah of the city yeah, that yeah. backed all I, five feet of water. No, I have one. That's interesting. <laughs> so there's that whole infrastructure. City infrastructure. Not being talked about. <laughs> I'm curious. If, like, can I? I don't, I'm sorry. We haven't even met. But can I like put you inside? I'm curious if you can talk about like other communities that you've worked with, either in Vermont or nationally, that so you know have experienced this kind of incident, whether it's flood or another kind of disaster. But like, how you help them think about how to respond to it the next time? Yeah, so I live in Woodstock, Vermont, right now, and I used to work for the Regional Planning Commission down there. So I've worked with you know Bethel a ton. Um, that kind of fizzled out. Um, but I did a lot of work in Kansas last summer, and they're very rural, very volunteer based, very similar to Vermont. And I mean, they get hit with all sorts of things tornadoes, flooding, you know, things that we don't kind of see. But uh, I did a recovery plan for like local recovery plan for all of the counties, towns, as well as the state. And um, that process worked well. It's really just getting people in a room together just to have them talk, you know, kind of setting up that coordination. So they know who to call, you know, like I'm going to call Mark to come help me organize volunteers for mucking out basements. I know that was an issue in Mont 
peculiar about turning volunteers away. We don't want that to happen. So, and, you know, kind of setting up that coordination, doing training, you know, tabletop exercises as well, just kind of continuing to bring people into the loop on that. That worked really well in there. It's really yeah. interesting is to, like, maybe, like, on our website, like, put some examples of some other communities that have done those kinds of things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just ignore me. <laughs> You're hard to ignore. <laughs> yeah. Very hard to ignore. But, but those, those are all good ideas. Yeah. Well, my the storage there. I can see what you do. I mean, and there's something to be right away. TV. It all got wet. <laughs> Paper towels, they got wet. That's right, so if we had some kind of storage thing, someone to help somewhere. Yeah, but I like that you know, it's not like the county is right. We could, but I think art. I guess there's, yeah, the the run of the short and short. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we are very interested in doing a community one of the most And I'm not sure if we are interested in not just with it. You guys are, I think, are well respected in the community. People know you yeah. and would trust you. And if you, 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 you somehow are associated with us, we are doing community outreach, people with you. So it was really like, when I told you about that list, and you said, let me know someone. Let me know. I said, do you know anybody else? And then that person said, you know, it's just. That is really, really hard because we we had a person who wasn't you know, who, who was doing something completely different. We didn't even know that the city was planning on maybe doing some renovation. She paying for it herself. So it's like it, that's really hard because you just it's not impossible. It's hard to pry into people. Personal business. Yes. And it's easy to say the wrong things. You know? I mean, I mean, a perfect example was my neighbor, one of my neighbors who whose basement came um, And they had just put all their pellets down for the winter, the wood pellets that they burn in her store. And they all got wet. She, she said to me, she said, well, you did apply for FEMA, but they, they rejected us. You need to send in your denial from your home owners, insurance, and FEMA uh, will most likely send you a check. You know? And she, she was like, oh. And I said, there's also the best thing was the lawyers <laughs> that did the, the, the work. That, that was very helpful for a moment. You know, a suggestion. But it's hard when people are. You, you don't want to insult them. Oh, you didn't. You didn't know that. <laughs> oh, well, I knew that. I mean, you gotta, you gotta stay away from these questions. Really listen. Yes. I, mean, I know I'm kind of off track. Well, just if you were interested to in help us do the community outreach, even if it was just saying, then yeah, go to that neighborhood over there, or go to that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Am I asking are we, are we past, I, a question? Just a question. Are we past that? I don't know. Are there I still don't people know. out there? I think people are saying there's people yeah. that we don't know about. Yeah. I don't know. What do you I mean, think? We had a lot of people on the hillside who so actually as we knew from the other night, right. a gentleman lost his house on, on top of a mountain. Right. So maybe, I mean, 
So I don't know. So we're thinking it's a waste of our time. I don't know. I, I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't know either. We're willing to try it. And then you know, some people are afraid to get involved in Governmental entities. Right, we're not government. No, no, I mean yeah. FEMA and. Oh, I see. From before, yes. You know, all those things. That's kind what of I think I was worried about. They'd rather not deal with governmental entities, yeah. agencies. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I'm worried about that there may be people out there that just didn't go do any outreach at all. You know, didn't get the help. Because they didn't want to. So, no, I don't know about what the need is. I'm, I'm wondering in my head. I mean, unless you're. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there could be isolated people who don't get out of their house and could be living in a flooded basement. Yeah, I mean, I'm know. also just. We, we thought that maybe some people who we were able to help, if they will talk to other people who have been reluctant. To ask for help, that it would that you know for you you for instance you know who who could say these people are you know are really there to help so you know and and yeah yeah conversation is easy enough what's that and I and I know that I would be sensitive to what's going on, not knowing what's going on with me, but kind of sees me when you see the eyeballs go. <laughs> um, so, I get I have the time. Next Thursday, it's at the United Unitarian Church in the Gap. I'm hopeful I can get some pieces somewhere. I'm going to have to talk about where we're going to go. What's that? Yeah. I have, do I have your email? I have your text. Oh, yes, I missed it. Katie, actually, it's good. Katie, you're walking in at just the right moment here. Because, uh, what's your name? Nona Estra. Uh, is it, say it, say it. N-O-N-A. No. No. Okay. Estra. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, are you related to Hans by any chance? Or? I am his mother. Ah, oh, I had such a great meeting with you last week. He's a great guy. Yeah, so, um, oh, he's great. So, uh, Katie, just to bring you up to speed, the concern being basically foot traffic, just like Katie and I were talking about. You know, just real concern about the that fabric of local business in Montreal. My fear is that yeah. there'll be nothing to save. <laughs> When the next flood comes, because they will. We felt the businesses will all be functioning. Yeah. So, and then, we're sort of in a position of uh, one or the other because people who are working from home, of course, they're doing something for instead of driving to their offices and whatnot. Yes. On the other hand, of course, it's, uh, it's not very good for the restaurant owners. No Regarding that second thing, there's somebody who works here. She does volunteer work once a week, and she was trying to organize a group that would meet at one or, or maybe several different restaurants at a certain regular, uh, like uh, every Wednesday. Or that was me. I was doing Oh, that, out of the senior center. That was your strategy of just trying to Well, then there's somebody some... else who was doing it also. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea. She, she had not much work for him uh, suggesting this, yeah. and only two people responded saying, uh, count me in. Yeah. So I think um, maybe we could form a little group to get, you know. That's a great idea. You know, what, was the, what was the idea? The idea is to get people to every Tuesday or every Wednesday to meet somewhere. Yeah, to go and together. Spread out and go to dinner or go to, together to dinner. A cash oh, month. Out lunch. Yeah. The cash month. A legislator called me and said, I'm organizing a cash month schedule. And so where are the businesses that really need this the most? The because term. I'll organize a group to make sure they know where to spend their money. <laughs> and I thought that was a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Like That's what dance, she called it. Like a dance mall, but a cash mall. Yeah, you just show up and you're ready to yeah. buy food or whatever. I don't know what to do with yeah, I've also been thinking about this mostly because of what people have been 
writing about the Front Porch Forum, about businesses. And after the flood, or soon after when we started the forums for resilience, yeah. um, I saw Blue Zone. I don't know if anyone else had seen that. But I brought it to the city, um, the city hall, and said, what is it? it it's called Blue Zone. And it's, it's about... It's a documentary, okay. and it's about there are countries that, where people tend to live over a hundred years old, and so they talk about, you know, what causes longevity in these particular countries. And I'm not going to get into that, but the feature of the film for me was really the last segment, where it talks about incorporating different things in the town that brings people together. And they the talk- basic skill is humans. Gathering. Yeah, gathering. gathering. So they had things like, um, like a place for people to connect, right? We don't have, in many countries, European countries, and um, where people come, there's a place where people, I'm thinking that maybe like the river. Like a plaza, kind of? Yeah, like a plaza thing where people like come, you know, they know, they can meet each other there. It's bringing people into town. Mm -hmm. And there are four premises for this particular, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, one of them is about physical activity. And also incorporating, we have a bike path, but there may be other things that we can have in town where people can come and just naturally take advantage of uh, things that they can do. Yeah, 30 people active. come to take a walk on the bike path, 20 of them might go and buy something in town or get Well, I'm looking at having it be part of the city, of town setting so that it's in town. It brings people, I mean, the bike path's great, but it doesn't, it might bring some people into town. But I think if we have things in town, then, you know, you might do some shopping with something you might not have considered um, buying or whatever when you're in town. You might yeah, there, there are those times like when they close off that portion of State Street, you know, those, creates a gathering, a gathering. Yeah, so you have social, uh, you know, in, in um, interconnectedness by having that plaza that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it's much easier when you live in a country where it's warm year round, which we don't have here. But there are plenty of other possibilities that we already have available to us that are inside. I'm looking at outside things from spring to fall. Where in this structure does this issue fit? You know, it's Katie and I were just meeting, right? Katie's the director of Mount Gilead Alive. Katie's on the commission. So, that's, you're the so one yeah, yes, yeah, and we talked about this a little bit. Um, does this lack of foot traffic downtown and um, the um, what it poses the the um, uh, yeah, just the problem that it poses for our downtown. How does that relate to resilience and recovery? So um, we're working on some of those things, but this is our current situation as well. It's another challenge environment. It's another thing that really needs to be addressed now. That's where a lot of my attention does go. And I think you're kind of onto something with how it connects to resilience. It's like community gathering downtown, community supporting one another, um, including the business owners, including, you know, if you have a healthy downtown and place making where people, plazas, people, where people can gather, then that is one aspect of creating a resilient community. Um, and it's not just about spending money in the, in the downtown businesses, it's also simultaneously about people gathering in the downtown. And that goes hand in hand. So that's how I see it connected to the work of the commission, and I feel like I have one of those connections. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work 
that is going on to that effect, but it's sad that it's an overarching kind of cultural change of trends, you know. It's harder to get people to shop local, it's harder to get people to gather, you know, as community. Um, well, the world current. and the nation are facing these challenges all at once now. Well, you have everyone shops online now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I would really encourage everyone to look at, if you have Netflix, to look at Blue Zone yeah. and look at Blue the Zone. last episode. The okay. last, it's one season only. There are four different, I don't know what you call them. Yeah, episodes. And it's the last episode that you want to look at that might fit with Montpelier. There might be some ideas in there. Absolutely, yeah. That's great. That's and great. the other idea that was floated yeah. uh, that you might not have heard of was uh, getting groups of oh you know you were you were saying called it a cash mob. Yeah. Yeah, that's so a, that's, that's a great that's idea. Too, so yeah. I, I too at the winter and there was a lot of ice on the road. I had a program with called uh, Walk for Exercise, and we were in front of my I saw, home. I would see you with the group, yeah, now that you say that. Yeah. yeah. And I saw your front porch forum post about it. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people have asked me if I'm going to do it again, so I think uh, probably tomorrow I'll put something in again on front porch forum. It used to be 1 o'clock every Sunday, and whether we stay on a um, uh, flat area or in climb hills, depending on. It's dependent on the people what they want to do. Is this on the Montpelier Front Porch Forum or does it go out to the uh, As far as I know, it's only on Montpelier. Yeah, I'm East Montpelier. So. Uh, yeah. Well, at any rate, um, I'm, unless it starts raining or pouring this weekend, I'll do it again this weekend. We would be at 1 o'clock in front of um, in front of the town hall. And then uh, we go around for about an hour. As I said, whether we climb hills or just stay on foot, terrain, it depends on people. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And then do you stop? Like, one thing you could do is, if, as you finish, an optional thing would be, like, go to the coffee shop or go to the. Is that part of it? Yes. Yeah. Right? So I was going to say, yeah. like, we could combine it now. Yeah. 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 You're giving me an idea. <laughs> yeah. I really want to help with. I think a lot of people want to help our downtown now because they're hearing these concerns on the Front Porch Forum and from the business community and from the community that cares about that downtown. I wonder if it's worth like a location, like a web page um, at our site that could speak to that. How to support our downtown now and then have these ideas listed like the community can take these ideas into their own hands, where we can list events there that draw people to the downtown. And how much staff do you have to do? <laughs> well, um, we did just hire one more full-time person, and, um, and then I have Carolyn Gradinsky, who's here, who's the part-time event coordinator. Yeah. So they're both people I work with are very motivated. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That's what we have. Yeah, I was thinking when you were saying everyone said City Hall or Town Hall. Why don't you come in and join us? No, I'd rather I sit too much. <laughs> and I'm wondering if in front of City Hall, if that could be one place where people could contemplate. It would be a great place for a ring plaza. Yeah. I know, so we talk about that a lot. I didn't hear what you said. A great place for a plaza or an activation for right. I think, you know, it's created with that intention, but it doesn't it doesn't meet that need very well and it could be recreated. And our design committee at Montpelier Live is very interested in pursuing that. I think it's been, you know, toyed with a bit over time, but I mean hearing feedback from the community helps direct our, our work and vision. So I'm writing that down. Yeah, the courtyard at the church is the other spot. Which oh, church? Where people I, do, in fact. That's, yeah. that's been such a nice spot. I and I think too. one of the reasons is that there's, a, there's actually space for more than two people to sit down. Right. Where, you know, whereas, is there 
what is it about the city hall location that isn't very inviting? It's <laughs> almost like you would have to sit alone on a rock bench. It's kind of horizontal. It's not, it's not, it's it's not, not comfortable. It's not, it doesn't allow for multi yeah, No, it's just right. not flat it's, it's, it's like also, you're not facing one. I think they you did know. it to keep people out. What 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 does it take to bring people together in this way we're imagining? So you know, it's what could be improved upon, but also what isn't you know what isn't in our downtown landscape that could be, or in that city hall plaza that could be. Ninety degree angles for city. A few of them. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a little bit of that on those those W's or whatever they were that were put out. The, the, the M's, aren't they M's? The M's. The M's. Yeah. 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 That doesn't do much somehow. I didn't find it very conducive. What were those? I don't know. They were sitting, they were sitting blocks because there's nothing oh, to yeah. talk about. Okay. But that are shaped like an M. Uh, but they're not really conducive in the conversation. I'm not sure why. We tried to sit on them, I'll say, two, two or three of us. And we couldn't quite get comfortable. Or, yeah, there's not something comfortable. And that's true with City Hall, in front of City Hall. I mean, it's hard to sit on a rock, but. <laughs> I mean, if you want to be there for a couple questions. of hours. What makes it, what makes for a comfortable? A comfortable spot. Spot. So we do have a few new, new folks. I want to be sure other folks have a chance. Richard, do you, do you want any context here? Or? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I was late. I'll just stop back. You the happen to be. You, oh yeah, you happen to be in the catch-all conversation. Oh, There's other stations, but this is kind of the popcorn, let's say, like whatever. But it's so. all around one issue, which is how do we get people downtown again? Because we'll lose the businesses we have if we can't. And there are several factors that may empty our community, and we don't know how to hold it. With two of them. Well, that's true because they won't rebuild it yet. And you're not going to get new business and if they know people left because of floods. So that's pretty big. We can finish cleaning up from the last one. Hi there. Come on in. Yeah. The bike yeah. path from the bridge on over is still loaded with silk. Are there other issues? I want to be sure other people have a chance to raise other other issues they're they're thinking about. So you just mentioned more cleanup. The bike path is an example of that. There's silt over at the transit center still piled up from uh -huh. last July. Yeah, and there's been no effort to get the 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 collected debris out of the river riverbank trees with plastic and styrofoam and everything in it. Uh -huh. It's just, it's a constant reminder of the, not only the ill preparedness for the next flood, but that we can't even seem to get the depression of the last one cleared out, you know? So more cleanup. Yeah. The senior center has something called trash trips. It's very effective, mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, they might, maybe they would yeah. have an arm that could. Uh, I think that would be more complicated. This oh. feels more like a Department of Public Works or okay. yeah. equipment. Because it needs a, a ladder. And or, yeah, a bucket, a bucket of water. Yeah. 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 Omar, I was talking to the prior director of Public Works today about it, who just joined the trans trash tramps. Oh, good. Trash tramps do graffiti and cigarette butts. They don't do no, that's major the flood. Team. Well, and, yeah. and, and, and garbage in general. Richard, did you have some? I was going to say, they are recruiting more volunteers than they could use some help. The so trash tramps go. If you yeah, uh -huh. aspire to be a trash tramp, please join the crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was an article recently about the trash tramp in, um, oh, what was that? Seven Days had a great yeah. story yeah. about it. It's very yeah. well done. Very well done. Yeah. 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 Nice, nice source of inspiration, I think, for our yeah. communities. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we've had a couple other people join. Do you have things on your mind? Oh, something? no, I just joined. I, I'm just. Listening? Listen to you. Oh, right. Yeah, ideas. How about you? Do I dare? <laughs> I'll go for it. Sorry. <laughs> Do I really Sorry. dare? <laughs> I say too much a lot of times. It's been 10 months since the flood. I am still unhoused. I still have no resolution. I still sleep on a day bed in my daughter's house. 
Should it be that way? I feel that we need, when we have these kind of things happen, that we need a person assigned to each and every person who was damaged. And you work with that person. FEMA, you talk to 50 people. SBA, you talk to 50 people. Every time the step changes, they have to tell your story. So I think a res resilient community would be one that stepped up and helped the folks really with what they need to lead them to recover. I don't know if that makes sense. But of course it does. Yeah. That's what I wanted to. I mean, we can talk about all these other things, you know, the watershed. Yeah, good. But getting down to the. We have, in Montpelier, we have 10 or 10 or 12 substantially damaged folks. And what that means is your house has been more than 50% damaged. And you need to either elevate it, move it, or demolish it. That's it. Buyout takes three to five years. I'll be dead by the time we buy the house. Why does this uh, 10 months with the SBA trying to get a bridge loan until I do the buyout? It's been a nightmare. Nightmare of red tape. There was someone, I had to find out all the answers from this in my neighborhood. I had to find out all the answers for ourselves. And we're pretty expert. Yeah. And I think if we had people in the community that were experts, they could work with the newly traumatized, damaged folks. Mm -hmm. I think a whole long way. So it's kind of a caseload for each person. Now, but what I find is we've had caseworkers assigned to us, but we're light years ahead of them. Is that right? Yeah, because I do know that they within been, Capstone, right, there is a they team. They haven't been trained. I mean, they're trained. They're sort of getting they, trained. Yeah. They don't have the experience. Okay. You know, so it's like, really? <laughs> I'm sorry, a, but there was a comprehensive article about the city of bridge right after the flood, and I believe that when you are when your home is substantially damaged, and the options that you, that you have will not leave you financially. No. You will be in great I can tell you if you have insurance, which everyone's required. Uh, if you are, have a mortgage, everyone's required to have insurance. Insurance pays, the, the way I see it, one third of what you really need. They only pay for what got wet. So two feet, only two feet got wet, that's all they pay for. Okay? They don't pay for the other part which you have to rip out because the water soaked up in or the water came in. They, they don't pay for it's expensive that. To so, for instance, let's just say most people got around $90,000 if they had uh, flood insurance. The total cost to repair back to what it was is running $322,000. Where does that come from if you're, if you're just a regular working bloke, retired, and <laughs> yep. no good answers? So, yep. You know, I, um, this does not address your immediate need, but I think part of the goal in establishing the Montpelier Disaster Recovery Network is, is to build that infrastructure and that expertise such that when the next one comes, we're more prepared. There's a lot right? of smart, educated people in Montpelier. Wicked. Yeah. We, could pull it, we could pull it together. Yeah, and I think the goal is for that to be the place where that work happens. But I have to acknowledge that they're building it right now, just like you say. So you're probably, you're ahead of them because you've been doing, doing so much of that. So, yeah. That's what I wanted to bring up for you.
thinking about the future is how do we structure it so people are taken care of and they yeah. don't, they're not. Um, and I'm sure you talked with Suzanne. Yes, yeah, so I've been working with Suzanne for a bit. And I've also joined the grant uh, writing committee of the city. Oh, the city put together, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Hopefully we can find some grants that give that kind of money to yeah. um, facilitate those kind of activities. Thank you. Yeah. Another factor is, of course, is how much time we have, you know, to uh, implement all these ideas. And of course, it's a way of um, things to be uh, in this community it seems to take so long sometimes, regardless of how, how important they are. So I'm not optimistic person. No, I, honestly, it's our job as a, as a commission to try to retain and grow the sense of optimism. I get it, right? You see, you see plans come and go, and you see things take a while. I think it's really, I mean, you heard, you heard Ben Doyle say it, like, it's, it's one of our challenges as a commission is to try to uh, account for that and to rebuild that sense of what's possible in this place without over-promising and being hollyish because it's hard work. The reality is it's hard work. It's not something that happens with a snap. But like we've got to have a sense that we can get things done as a community. And as a property owner, I'm concerned about taxes. I mean, what if we don't talk about money when we're talking about all these things? So, I mean, it all sounds good and I'd like to have it, but there's just so much that people can pay and have afford a home, otherwise they leave here. It's expensive already. Yeah. I see some new people who've joined us. I want to be sure, especially with the bell ringing, it might be a good moment to pause if anyone wants to move on, move on to another conversation. Uh, yeah, but um, really appreciate the, the feedback and just invite that. I'm not encouraging you to leave, but just want to give people an opportunity to do that and then invite other people in, into the conversation as well. So. Hi there, welcome. Hi. Hello, welcome. So this is really just a free for all, honestly. Yeah, like, see it, it is. It, yeah. It, we do have those other issues that I talked about earlier, but but it's really op open for all. Okay, so. I've been so good. I'm just stopping in to see what's going, what the gist of you know things are. Um, I'm just thinking about it. You know, I've, I've just seen a lot of, and I, I hear where you're coming from. I've, I've seen a lot of pessimism. The, the bridge was very pessimistic. I read, what was it, last week about how the businesses are really struggling. And I've been talking to some people, and they are really struggling. And then you have the people coming into Montpelier, and, um, you know, so the rents are ridiculously high. There is no moratorium on that. The you know I cannot believe what because I lived here in PA. Like I cannot believe what people are paying to live here these days. So when you look at that, when you look at how much you know people are dealing with, you know, with taxes, with their, uh, you know, the businesses with their overheads, the tenants doing dealing with uh, recovery and dealing with um, how uh, you know just different issues about how we're not connected enough as a community, which I really appreciate the community meeting out there because I think that's a part of all of this is how, you know, there's a disaster, but I know I was on Elm Street, I live on Elm Street, and I was ISIS. I did not hear from anybody, I did not, I was just in panic, oh, it was horrible, you know. And, you know, so I think if we can move forward just in that sense, the other pieces perhaps could come together more, you know, because when a community, the whole world is in danger with all of these factors right now. You know, the, the whole world, you know, our environment is in a terrible place. You know, the economy is in a terrible place. And we're looking at, uh, you know, 
we're at risk of a dictatorship in America. And I just lay it on the line that way, right? So what what would this mean to all of us in the way of our resilience? If we're not strong as a community, what are we? Right. Yeah, and I, I think what I would say is part of our work is really figuring out what's within our control as a community. Like what, how, uh, there are a variety of things that are outside of our control. Uh, what are the resources that we control uh, here, and what's the work that, that we can be doing collectively? So, we gotta start small. Absolutely, yeah, there it is. Yeah? Uh, well, I hate to be optimistic, but <laughs> um, we actually have had a, an effective way to bring people in the community together around disasters. And that was the capital area networks, which I'm sure has been mentioned in some of these other groups. It's been mentioned in almost every meeting I've gone to for the past year and a half. Sure. Yep. Um, and I was involved very centrally with that. And um, it was done away with by the city manager. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, speaking of taxes, it costs almost nothing to do because it's done by by and with volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, it had some structural problems. Uh, the, the, the main one being that most of the communities were too big. So I, I was the uh, um, community, the CAN coordinator in College Hill. I had 132 um, families. Now, when I moved across to Mountain View, I had 31 families. And with 31 families, I kept those people. That's a scale that makes sense. I kept those people abreast of everything that was going on. I got people to go to city council meetings. I got people to go to, to uh, DRB meetings. I got people. People knew me. People knew from me before they knew from the emergencies that, that there was a water main break, uh -huh. right? They, and, and people felt supported. And this was not. This was a very heterogeneous group. There were, there were renters up there. There are people who are, are seniors and are, are homebound. And it, it, so that it, it, it does, even though it's, it's only 31 people, 31 families, when you multiply that times, we should have had probably 50 can neighborhoods instead of 20. Okay. So that we could, could, could really manage the whole thing. Yeah. I, I would strongly recommend reviving that. Mm -hmm. I, I submitted a blueprint for doing it for virtually nothing. All we needed was money for Zoom. Mm -hmm. Because that's the other way. Zoom was fantastic. We, were, we, we got people in District 3 to uh, go to a Zoom uh, um, candidates uh, uh, forum. We got people then, once the candidates were elected, we had got two new people, we had, we had uh, office hours on Zoom with them. Okay, all of this made uh, people in, in District 3 feel a lot more represented mm -hmm. by their, uh, their city council. Yeah. Do other people have experience about with the Capital Area Network? I'm just curious if others... Yeah, yeah. see Andrea? Yeah, yeah I, I was in a group talking People, a lot of people don't remember that it actually was initiated at the time when another emergency was anticipated. It hadn't happened, but it was anticipated, which is in 2008, 7, 8, there was the expectation that there was going to be a huge spike in the cost of fuel oil, and that lots and lots of people were not going to be able to afford to heat their homes. And that was that was when it was initiated, was to create a network of people who could identify who in their neighborhood was at risk of not being able to heat their home that winter. Now, as things turned out, that did not happen. But the financial... Uh, well, then we did, uh, there was that after that came later, but, but that particular anticipated emergency didn't occur. Um, and, and so the structure was created with that in mind, and then some of the neighborhoods continued more in a social context and started doing potlucks and other kinds of things. But I, I, I think 
the but things that you brought up about scale. But that sustainable and peculiar took over management. I remember that. And yeah. tried to revive the, the mutual aid part of it, right. not, not the block party part of it. Right. But I think your point is well taken that to make it manageable, particularly in the case of an emergency, I think smaller groupings, you know, two streets, you know, two cross streets or something like that is probably as much as could be reasonably coordinated <coughs> for anything, whether you're talking about, you know, civic engagement or you're talking about emergency response mm -hmm. or even just monitoring what's going on with people and how are people doing. So I hope, I hope discussion will continue about finding a way to, to recreate that idea or re-energize that yeah. idea. There's a lot of people out there who were involved who are still interested in being involved. Yeah. And they all had different experiences. But I think scale is one thing. And also, not to not to pop your optimism balloon, but I think we also have to be planning for more person-to-person -person communication. You know, if, if we have the kind of emergencies we may have, Zoom won't be an option. Cell phones may not be an option. We need to have a way. Well, that's another know, reason why it needs you know, to be smaller groups. Right. Well, maybe, I, the, you yeah. know, maybe the neighborhood has its own air horn or something that somebody stands on their porch and fires off the air horn to let people know that something's going on. And just to sort of bring it back to and report back on, on sort of what commission priority this aligns with, you know, we're talking about that um, essentially that local community-based emergency management plan. And that's not really the term we're using for it. But that is, I think, going to be one of the places for that conversation. Well, and I also yeah. think what you were saying really speaks to the idea of prevention, of bolstering the community connections ahead of time. Yeah. Not, not just for use in the emergency, but for just in general, general building of the strength. That's what makes a strong community. Yeah, yeah. 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 Don't, don't limit it to emergency. You know, I, I don't know how many people, I, I, I have children and grandchildren here. I don't know how many people are in that situation. Do you know how many people moved here over, during the pandemic who were working remotely and their kids go to school and they play soccer and they're never at these meetings because they don't have the time. Mm -hmm. You just don't have the time. We, I, I have people in our neighborhood and I was able to pull them into what, what they could do. Sure. Right? Getting a front porch forum announcement is when you get them to this meeting. Sure. Getting a notification, they don't even know about notifications. Mm -hmm. Right? So, the Montpelier has changed, the population of Montpelier has changed a lot. And I don't know how many people realize how much it has changed. Mm -hmm. It's not all old time reflecting in here. <laughs> well, it's definitely on the list. <laughs> All right, other people, we have new arriver who maybe, yeah. Uh, oh, we're going to do a little rotating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I witnessed people, there was folks camping in Confluence Park, there was people camping under the Pavilion Hotel porch, those, those people got washed out completely, and there's been no effort to restore. We have fewer downtown public bathrooms than we had before the flood. There's been no priority. Is there something less than none? <laughs> well, City Hall basement bathrooms used to be the two private bathrooms. Not 24 hours. They're correct, but they could have easily been. I know, hours. but they weren't. I know, you heard me plenty on that. <clears throat> but my point is that the a lot of this sounds bourgeois. You know, we're going to talk about putting engagement and planning. It's like we, we got some urgency here to solve some immediate problems that people are have no place to wash up or sleep safely or you know be ready for the next flood and the kind of community plan that's going to address all the things that the city's joke of a plan i was shocked and repulsed by the the flattery that that guy gave to the city's emergency continuity of operations plan because it's nothing but a joke and well, I think that's another place where a strong neighborhood system. You're going to need plans, but also, also help. Each you know. little neighborhood is going to yeah. need its own plan to identify who has what, who has ropes, who has lights and batteries and ham radio and etc. Because you're not going to be able to do this on a, a citywide scale. There's, and relying on volunteers 
inordinately is also not sustainable. No, I don't, I don't agree. I think vol vol volunteerism has two functions. One is to get the job done, and the other is to actually engage people so that they feel they are a part of the solution, so they don't feel helpless, so that, they, that their fears are are kind of put aside so that they can act. I, mean, I, I, I know, by the way, Steve, I, think guys, I, I just yeah. wanted to be sure we're sort of having an inclusive conversation and go too, go too deeply on it. You two are welcome to continue that, but I just want to be sure other people. Well, I just wanted to clarify, to chime in. clarify that the responsibility for compiling the detailed level plan that each community needs to be ready, that is probably too much to rely on a volunteer for. Hopefully, hopefully that's at least the scaffolding that the commission is going to be able to start to create to build. That that then a local neighborhood can look at that and say, oh, okay, in our neighborhood we're going to have to do this a little differently because of X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. But there's something there to start with. But what preparedness for this year are we? If we have another flood this year. I mean, to be honest, that's there's a reason there's a consultant here tonight, and we're getting to work on this one is because of that urgency. Uh, it's the commission feels it's consultant, uh, the ones around developing the emergency plan. Are you still for government? Well, Eric is not here. No, but her 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 compatriot uh, Tori is is here. But I'm what I'm assuring you of is that there's urgency on that on that very subject because the sense well, is it, it, we don't know when the next flood is coming. Well, and it's not just going to be floods. I mean, the heat we had in the last couple of days is just a preview. Yeah. We're going to see this summer. Right. And if anybody read the hurricane report, that's pretty scary. Twenty-five <laughs> days storms. Yeah. Well, just the fact that there will be more storms, they will be more intense, and, and the northeast is where they're going to hit. Yes. Yeah. So, I think we can't get here. Oh, we focus just, on the flood. <laughs> we've got to be prepared for whatever Mother yeah. Nature throws. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. And the, yeah. the city plan has to have resiliency in there, not just flood. The city plan wording so it specifically says floods. Okay. okay. And it, it absolutely has to be we just broad. focus on flooding. Well, and anything that's constructed. In terms of planning, so it has to be flexible. It has to be, you know, sort of plug and play for, oh, okay, this is our, our structure for flood response, but then if we have a heat emergency, this is the direction we have to go. And these are the other people that have to be involved. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden we need a lot of banks of ice, not banks of sand. <laughs> Where do we get them? <laughs> and we have a homelessness emergency because the state throws people out of motels. And if we have a drug emergency, I mean, there are a lot of emergencies that we need to be able to face as a community. Right. Resilience is not uh, just about flooding. I think we heard you. Yeah. Got it. When I came to the neighborhood, I can't remember what it was called, but the like, neighborhood This, neighborhood this was yeah. exactly what. Okay. Yeah. It, it essentially good. went away, but there's it, real it, it encouragement. It started out as the community action network uh, because it was the response to an anticipated emergency. And then it morphed into the capital area neighborhoods, which was more of a social, you know, gathering kinds of things. And then it, it has. You know, kind of no, they did not. It was canceled by the city manager. That was community action in that They both they usually kept the same effort. You have anything you want to add? We're just kind of it's a free for all at this point. So. And it has been from the beginning. So it was actually very good. Ruth, how about you? Any other topics that you're yeah. taking around? Uh, there was mention early on about the checklist, like response checklist, like what to do. The, with, who's kind the of, toolkit. Yeah, the toolkit. Uh, I mean, I would say it's a commission priority for sure. Uh -huh. uh, Central Vermont yeah. economics. Uh, are you thinking about it on the residential side oh, of the yes. business? I'm like, the next time the basement floods, what do I do? Yeah, what do I do? <laughs> exactly. So we, are, we are the leader in the community. It will become a component of yeah, yeah, the broader yeah, community yeah. sort of emergency response. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to bring that down to the house more. And that that 
checklist, as you described, really needs to integrate with what's happening at the city level, to some degree the state, and to some degree even females, right? You kind of need those layers. And so, sure. There's just so much responsibility on it. Now, do you think individuals are the first layer of responsibility, kind of, and so exactly. you can do yourself. Right, right. Yeah. Are we reconvening as a full group in like five? Uh, I'm, I'm from, yeah. I know that. I think we just have to do this stuff on all the folks. But yeah, I don't think we go to the The same skill levels. Sure. And then, and then, and then, so we have to have those other more forms of communication with more people that you know, I mean, airports, airports, <laughs> airports on porches could be a very effective way of doing it. Just to make sure but, that everybody but, knows but that one person can't do it, right? Like mm -hmm. it's got to be a community driven, mm -hmm. but organized. That's yeah. my, like my feeling is like we really have to focus on what's the system here, but we have to get the community engaged yeah. and the, the neighborhood, you know, that network thing is a model that existed and, you know, how can we work on it? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, because that yeah. original work is actually over here, we only got, we only got, you know, we're fortunate that it kind of truncated what was happening yeah. because yeah. the first thing we were doing was yeah. to get the city of Boston and then we were talking to the city of Boston and then we were talking to the city of Boston that year was just surveying the neighborhoods, going around and knocking, literally knocking on doors. Yeah. I mean, that was what we did. We yeah. knocked on doors and we asked people, you know, what's your situation? You think you're deep, what's your land? You think you're deep, blah, blah, blah. And, and even that was challenging because a lot of people were, you know, won't answer the door. They don't want to talk to you. Or, and especially in a day and age when we got so accustomed to just communicating over right. Zoom yeah, that exactly. people now yeah. shy away from the first yeah. days. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, but I think somebody shows up at my door, I'm yeah. immediately. Yeah. Just like getting like mail. Yeah. 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 It's like getting postal mail. Not so big of it. Whoa, we got a letter! Yeah. Somebody sent me a letter. Yeah. And it actually got here. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, <laughs> and in the moment, I, like, my situation was probably a little strange because, stupidly, I was coming home from vacation on the day of the flood and we got to Montpelier and couldn't get to our house and because we were totally cut off and it's like midnight. What are you doing? We're like, what are we going to do? You know? and what did you do? I had one coworker who I had a feeling might still be up that late, and so we looked up on the hill in Berlin, so I called her and I'm like, can we crash? And she took us in, and you know, it was fine. But, 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 but at the mo in that moment, it just was like, I had no idea where to turn for any kind of information or anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's I think know, the, a weird situation most people don't have. I was involved <laughs> with, um, in the flood response with the Mitzvah Fund and the animals. Oh, the, the Civic that. Center. But <laughs> but one of the things that the, the, the animal disaster response team focuses on in their outreach in between emergencies is go bags. Is they help oh, people develop yeah. a go bag. In that case, they're helping the go bag, which everyone should oh, yeah. have. Just like have. So and one, for every one member of the family, right. you have a go bag sure. that you yeah, need to okay. stop a certain things that you need, and you have a go bag or more than one go back in your car. Right. Um, but in that case, they were helping. Take the way. Thank you, Ben. So uh, we actually are going to bring uh, our facilitators back up to give a very quick uh, summary, and then uh, and then we're going to close. Uh, and I guess I'll go first. So I was facilitating sort of the the catch-all group and. I would say there was three themes uh, that we heard in there, uh, although I'm sure I'll miss some stuff, but one was just a deep concern about the, uh, the, our businesses downtown and what we can be doing as a community to support them. They're facing sort of a multi-headed multi uh, threat in terms of the flood and in terms of remote work, and they're just not seeing the foot traffic that they were a few years ago. So that, that was really loud and clear amongst the group. There was also some talk about uh, the old capital area neighborhoods or community action network or whatever it was in its other iteration, some real uh, talk about sort of bringing back some model of neighborhood organization 
and then finally some talk about uh, really some personal stories about people still struggling with the impacts uh, of the flood that uh, is important for us to not lose sight of. Uh, now I'm going to hand it off to Nate. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Nathan Suter. I was facilitating the group talking about surveying and assessing downtown buildings. Uh, I had a good, good and talkative crowd, and thank you for showing up for that. Themes that came out of that, um, I would say one of the strongest one, ones was essentially, what do we already know? Don't, don't you have answers for this? And speaking for myself, I said, I do not. That's one of the things we're trying to seek. Um, however, we are certainly not the first community in the world to flood, nor will we be the last. And there's been a ton of learning, and we wish to gain from that. Um, there was also some discussion about if we do a good job of this idea of surveying buildings and giving those owners a checklist and a toolkit to act on, is that something that is transferable or translatable across our state and across our communities? And certainly we hope so. Um, I also want to be careful not to, uh, to be humble because we may, there may be other communities, even in Vermont, who are already ahead of us, right? It's not, we're probably not the first one to have this idea. Um, and then, I'm probably missing something else. Oh, I think, I think there was just a putting, bringing home the point that uh, I, I ended up using a sort of medical analogy, right? Show me, the patient, show me the patient and we'll talk about the treatment. Every building is a different location. Every building is a different structure. Every di building is a different use. Every building has a different exposure to risk. And so that's what we are trying to figure out is get the expertise in there so that we can give a report to each building owner and then when they have the ability to act, they can make decisions that are well informed. Uh, I'm going to pass the ball to Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Holler, and I was with Stephanie in the um, River Improvement Group. And I think the main message that we heard was, well, really, people wanted to understand what the um, what the funding was for and what the projects might be about. I think that. Um, our community is really fortunate that um, this engineering analysis and process is already underway and by fall it's going to yield potential projects that really, if undertaken, could very likely be funded by FEMA in a big way and then also reduce um, the amount of flooding that our community sees in the future. So um, that ball is really on its way um, and that's exciting, but people wanted to understand what that was about. And then um, the biggest piece of feedback we got is that, okay, that's great, let's do some projects, let's try to reduce our future flooding, but what about the rest of the watershed? This really needs to be um, done in consideration of things that other communities are doing, um, protecting our um, forests, um, protecting uh, floodplain and wetlands uh, up and downstream. And that was really an overlap, I think, that probably um, with what was talked about in the regional conversations, but I'd say those were the two biggest things that come out of come out of our group. Can I take that segue? <laughs> Am I jumping in line? Uh, I think uh, it was it was a perfect segue for the regional conversation group. Um, there, it, starting with that, actually, I, I was really impressed and and by the the conversation that you, as a group who joined us, led about recognizing that it, that it's about the for it's not just you know we, it's easy to focus sort of on the riverbanks. And, you know, and the river quarter itself, because that's where the water is. But it's not always where the water comes from. It's not where the water starts and comes from. And so recognizing that we're talking about the forest, we're talking about the full flow in all aspects of the watershed and, and where those solutions can lie. Um, we heard from Pat Moulton some really important information about uh, FEMA monies coming down the pike for Vermont in general um, and conversations starting in June uh, that will start to affect where and how those funds are spent statewide to affect changes to, to, to slow the water down, to improve river management, watershed management. Um, we heard a, a living embodiment of the need for these conversations, because in our group there were, there were numerous experts within the, who, who joined the group at different times or references to other experts around the state doing different work. And it was a wonderful highlight to there are so many intelligent, wonderful voices in the state doing so much important work. Um, 
it's gonna be impossible for them all to connect with each of the other ones. And so there has to be groups, I hope, like, like our commission, who play that convening role and say, hey, talk to this person. Hey, talk to this person. Hey, you're doing that, make sure you coordinate with this person. So that was it. We, we heard wonderful references to both the need for high-tech solutions and low-tech solutions, that there's room for both. And obviously associated nice breaks in cost potentially with the lower tech solutions that can play important roles in slowing water down. Um, finally, uh, the, the, the sort of the contrast, the push and pull um, of the urgent and the long term. Um, there, was a, there was a wonderful call to say, hey, there's urgency here. Um, and a recognition that regional conversation um, doesn't mean, can't mean sort of long flowing, you know, easy going conversations that were, were over decades. And we're, we're, we're trying to address urgent problems. And so those conversations have to happen now, identifying very real solutions that can start as soon as possible. But recognizing that many of the solutions we're talking about can't happen tomorrow. We are talking about large scale, you know, watershed improvements, watershed changes that by, des by necessity, by, by physicality, by cost, by everything else, many of them are going to take time. Some, some quicker, some much longer. But, and recognizing um, as a community that we, we need to act with urgency and we also have maybe to have a little bit more patience to wait for solutions that might take longer than we would want them to. I think Jamie stole my segue um, because we have, we have lots of the same conversations, right? How do we integrate all of this work as a whole? We were talking about the River's Edge Master Plan, which is really thinking about within the city limits, what are the ways that we can bring together the work uh, that has been done, the work of the city, the work of uh, the state, the work of other partners along the way to understand what is there presently, what work has been done, how do we bring those things together, how do we take the science and the data that we're gonna gain from other more technical studies and bring them together to think about what's possible within our community moving forward. What I took away from this conversation is an eagerness from the you know, 15 or 20 folks who sat there, many of them for the whole conversation, who were ready, ready to sign up and ready to be part of that group that moves that work forward. And that's what I love about this community and that's what I'm really excited about. So thank you very much for participating. And uh, we were part of the emergency, uh, the, the action plan um, group over there. And I completely forgot I was supposed to talk, so I don't really remember what we talked about. <laughs> the highlights that I do remember, though, really revolved around um, in, engaging in regional conversations as part of it. The question was asked, are there other communities that are doing this? How well are they doing it? Are they doing it better or worse than we have? What can we learn from them? So that's some feedback that we took. Um, there was a big focus on people wanting tools to help them prepare for the next time while the skies are blue before the things happen. And that involves, that, that, that goes to the individual residents of what, what, how do you prepare your home for the next time? How do businesses prepare for next time? How do we as a community prepare for the next time? And um, yeah, that was that. So thank you very much for coming. And communication. And, that's right. Communication was another big part of it, that some folks felt there was no information, and some other folks knew that there was plenty of information. It was just not in all the places that everybody looks, right? So everybody receives information in different ways, and we need to be very cognizant of that in letting people know what's happening and how they can contribute. Thanks. Uh, we're going to close with, uh, well, I'll just say our commission members are multi-talented and you're about to get to experience that uh, multi-talented na nature of the team. Uh, as they prepare, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is not, while the commission has a set of priorities, the truth is this is a com community endeavor. It's really gonna, uh, it, it takes a team to do this work. And this, the format of this conversation is emblematic of how we see this work happening, which is there's tremendous expertise in this community and there's tremendous wherewithal. And that's part of what makes us strong and that we're gonna have to draw on that 
as, uh, as we do this work. Uh, I'll mention our webpage, uh, montpelierstrong.org. I'm about to have an email address that's just going to be jon at montpelierstrong.org. That should be live in the next couple of days. We really want you uh, to be in touch with us. You saw we were taking careful notes. We will come back together as a commission, really be thinking uh, uh, together about what we heard tonight, and then we're rolling up our sleeves and getting, getting to work with action planning as we, as we move this work forward. And now, uh, I'm going to be quiet, because we've got Mark and Kate. And all of you, for, for those of you, are you ready? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> For those of you whose worst possible nightmare is uh, holding hands and singing kumbaya in a circle, please circle up and hold hands. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about to happen. You ready? <laughs> All right. Mark, are you it's, okay with the lights going off so they can be, be Sure. The less they can see of us, the better. <laughs> is that, Katie, does that work, work for you? Yeah. I can hold on to you with my own two hands, and I can comfort you with my own two hands. But you got to use, oh, use your own two hands, use your own, use your own two hands. We've got to use our own, use our own.
Thank you, everybody, for coming.